So we were talking about the getting up for a training session. How do you get ready for a training session? And if you guys didn't know, we're doing a freestyle today, right? We Me are. and Alex were talking before Bang. and we, we don't want to do the intro. We're ready to rock and roll. But getting up for a training session is one of the hardest things to do, especially when you're going through a grinder week. Yeah. And, and me and Alex were just discussing that. So Alex, what were we talking about? What were some of the key points to that? Well, I mean, we talked about like a routine. We talked about like creating an approach and like one of the, the best ways that I do this and I like I, I've seen in other things like your the mat, right? Your training mat is you treat it as like sacred grounds, right? When you step onto the mat, it's business. It's a different mindset. You're there to train, right? If you want to talk and bullshit and this and that, step off the mat. Mm-hmm. It's easy, right? Like you step, you put your sandals on, you get onto the concrete or the rubber flooring or whatever is outside of the mat. But in jujitsu, you do your little bow thing, right? Exactly. Like you, you treat that as sacred space. I, I think that's a, a common thread through many martial arts, right? Wrestling room, like you know, in college when we stepped onto the wrestling mat in practice, you had your wrestling shoes on, they were tied, your headgear snapped, your shoe, your laces taped, right? I did none of that. I did all of that. Um, <laughs> right. Very different approaches. Um, yeah. So this is going to be a fun conversation because I have a very different approach to say, getting up for polar practice. opposites. Yeah. Um, well, describe your approach. Austin. tell us how you got mentally in the right space for practice. When I was an athlete, reminds me, when I was in the glory days, <laughs> Back in no, but like, I was the type of athlete that I, you didn't have to excite me for practice. I just, I love, I love doing that thing the same way I love my job now. And don't be wrong. That doesn't mean you don't have hard days and days that you don't feel ready to get up for that. But the way I got ready was by fucking around and having fun because that's how I tried to wrestle. Yeah. So like I would walk in, I just fuck around with my friends. I would do my fun stuff. I'd tie my shoes on the mat. I'd tell some jokes. I'd skip, sing, whatever. And then when it was time to go, you flip the switch, right? If we're going live, I'm not fucking around. Yeah. But the way that I got ready for practice was to almost be as carefree as possible, to feel myself having fun, yeah. to fuck around with Mason Geary or Cody C, talk shit to Dustin Weinman about whatever dumb shit he was doing <laughs> that day. Like it was, it was to get in a headspace of I don't have to worry about anything because yeah. I'm having fun now. And as soon as I was ready to have fun, I was ready to learn and I was ready to get better. But if I had to like lock in and be a hardo and and really like focus on what's going on, I personally wasn't going to get a whole bunch out of that session because that would mean like I'm artificially doing that. Yeah. Well, where again, that was kind of my approach to a T, right? Like I I would fuck around and talk shit and stuff, but I would like save that for the locker room, right? Like as I'm putting my shoes on the locker room, you're doing whatever, like that's the time to have fun, talk shit. Uh, and, and et cetera. When I started walking up to the practice room, that was kind of my like, get ready, get in the zone type of deal. As soon as I stepped on the mat, like it, it wasn't get ready anymore. It's like, you're in it, right? I have my fingers taped. I have my laces taped. I like already have my headgear on, like it's time to get to work. Right. Mm-hmm. And like, and, and I think what you said a little bit is important to, to realize is like, you, if you don't want to do your training session, you don't want to go to practice. That's a completely normal feeling, right? right? I feel like people get in their head about that is like, I don't want to do this. Why don't I want to do the thing that I love? It's like, I, some days I look forward to this. It's like, it's like anything. Like some days you're just going to wake up in a shitty mood. Does that mean that you shouldn't do life anymore? It's like, no, you know, it's like, God, I hope not. Right. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to go to practice today, but I'm committed. And so I'm going to do, that's like, uh, that's what Mike Tyson says about discipline, right? And so well, hold I on. think you just said that, but you didn't say the quote. What's Mike Tyson's know. quote on discipline? Oh man. I don't know if, <laughs> if verbatim. You can't say that and not say the fucking quote. <laughs> I feel like people know it. Um, it's I don't know. Doing, I would like to know. Doing the thing you don't want to do as if it's something you would love to do or something along those lines. Like discipline is doing what you don't want to do as if you would love to do it or some shit like that. Okay. I'll take that. Right. I don't know if Mike was that well-spoken, but I'll take that. Something like that. Um, you know, some shit I heard on Joe Rogan. That's all that is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, honestly, like there are a lot of days I wake up and I don't want to do a training session or I don't want to coach a training session, mm-hmm. right? This is a, a more apt example of strength and conditioning. Do I want to be at my 6am every day? No. 
Some days do I love it? Yes. Some days do I have to push through and be a little artificial about that? Yes. So I think there, there's a, a real a realistic approach to like knowing I'm not going to get up and want to do this every day, but I'm still going to do it. Well, I think it comes down to the type of person you are, right? Like for me, if I start to feel stuck or if I start to feel monotonous or like I, I'm not progressing, that's when I get disinterested. That's when I don't want to be there. That's when yeah. I don't learn personally. So that's why I had my approach. If every day is a different day, even if the practice is the same, if every day I'm just fucking around having fun doing things and then I lock into practice, it doesn't feel as monotonous. Like my, I think I've said on here before, but like everybody's like, oh, what's your biggest fear? People like spiders and heights. Mine is stagnation. Mm -hmm. I never want to be stagnant ever in my life because that to me, that is when life starts to go downhill in my head. That's what I start thinking about. And when wrestling becomes stagnant and when you start to feel stagnant, I didn't want to be there anymore. And I did have that certain times in my career, yeah. right? Like I, I believe it was my sophomore year of college. Like I started to feel a little bit stagnant. And even though I had a pretty good season, like I, I started to feel like I wasn't learning as much as I should. And that's when I started to like try to find ways to have fun. Yeah. Like you remember we used to do like the fucking rock, paper, scissors. The other person had to carry the other person up and like a buddy yeah, yeah, carry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like, that's when, like that's where me and uh, the kid named Tyler Schneider were having a whole lot of fun. Like, don't be wrong. Tyler was a fucking weirdo. I love that. I love that. I love that weirdo, but he was a fucking weirdo, but I would start fucking with him and I would literally like, we do rock, paper, scissors. And he had a tell every time I knew what the fuck he was going to do. I think I went like 15 and O and I had to carry tell in rock, paper, scissors. Dude, he would, he would do like eye movements where he would like look one way and I knew it was going to be scissors. I think you're the weirdo. I might be. But I was starting to analyze, but this is what made me have fun. I'm like, how can I find a way to beat him in rock, paper, scissors, right? How can I find a way to continue this streak? And that got me more and more excited. And that got me into the mood to go practice. That got me into the mood to go learn. That got me into the mood to feel like I'm going to get something out of this session. And that's something that our coaches, I thought, did a really good job of where they gave me just a way to get a little bit more carefree. That little bit of carefree attitude allowed me to fully express myself on the mat a little bit better. Yeah. So I think that's like part of this like um, questioning is like, we've all been to practice where the coach gives a kick-ass rah-rah speech at the beginning and you're motivated and you're jumping into practice like <laughs> and you gung-ho. forget it the next day <laughs> right you forget it the next day like the motivation is super temporary but the the same argument can be made it's not on that coach to make the rah-rah speech every fucking day right that that would insinuate a problem in itself so you know as a coach i think picking your shots on that is is really important right you know this is a day where we're gonna do some shitty work or we're going to have a hard practice. Maybe that's a good rah rah day. Maybe the other day is a good like way to start practice in a different way. Give the athletes a problem to solve, give them some freedom, give them this, like play a game. Right. I think as a coach, you have some different tools in your, your belt to make the day more interesting. I think there's a, a huge piece for consistency and discipline, like in your warm up and your routine for practice. But I think there's also a freshness that comes with like, organized gamification or arm organized like uh tools to get people ready to go in a different way right like there's there's teams that play spike ball like valiant plays spike ball or they play handball or they play soccer right that gives them something to where they don't feel like they have to be locked in from start to finish that allows them to express their creativity and that creativity allows them to actually learn but then there's some people that they need to like Alex, Alex needed to be locked in in order to learn. That's just how he operated. And it was, it, we were just different people, but that's on the coaches to understand what is the majority of your team? Yeah. If you the know majority what? of your team is straight laced as fuck, well, yeah. guess what? You got to keep it straight laced. Yeah. You got to do the warm up the way it's supposed to be done every day. Right. Well, I find that's a, a unique observation too. Like, you know, in a lot of MMA gyms or pro fight gyms, right? you don't see coaches running organized warmups, right? Which I think is kind of a flaw outright, but the guys that need to be dialed or need that organization and structure are doing it themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way I've kind of like um, grouped this as a coach is like those guys that need the structure. They're not really guys I need to worry about the, the couple guys for is at least being locked in or warmed up 
sake. The guys I need to worry about are guys that are undisciplined and, and late, right? Or some of the guys, you know, like yourself that like to, to fuck around and get in a fun mood before practice. And 100%. again, that might be how they need to be mentally before practice, but that doesn't mean that they're physically there or um, like ready to go per se. Right. So no, yeah, you, you got to make sure like if, if it's somebody like me, you got to make sure that they're there because sometimes I'm thinking about other shit, right? Or I got that, too many things going on in my head. So right, sometimes then, like that, you got to be able to bring somebody back to center like yeah, that. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's a mental thing too is like that because that, there's no like on or off switch to that, that fucking mm-hmm. around, right? Get, mm-hmm. Like, because if you let it and I've definitely been in practices like this, <laughs> we get 20 minutes in. And some of my guys are still fucking around. Yeah, right? it's I'm, like, I'm untying somebody's yeah. shoe as they go down in the middle of a drill. 100%. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I need you to fucking focus right now. Like that's, uh, that's one of the harder things as a coach is to can control that like attitude going into your training session. For like, sure. um, and I've used things like uh, a timer and a bell and um, just like ways that I can foster that focus is like, and, you know, you come together and you're like, hey, guys, I love the question. I love that you're sharing ideas. But right now is not the time to share with your partner your favorite takedown from this position. I'm going to set the timer for four minutes. You're going to go one and one. This is time to just get fucking reps. Shut your mouth. Let your body do the work. Let's get some reps. You know, it's like communicating those expectations is, is huge. Well, and it's it's big on the coach to be able to command the respect and command the lead, like have the leadership to get the athlete on board with that. Yeah, because it's it is a hard thing to pull somebody that's a little bit more carefree back to center and being and being able to have them like understand why they have to. Right. Yeah. Like I said, like I got too many I got too much shit going on in my head. I got ADHD brain out the wazoo. So yeah. when I'm having fun and doing stuff, I'm, I might be like right now, sometimes like I could be training. And I'm thinking about four or five different things at the time just yeah. because that's how that's what's going on. It's on the coach or it's on whoever that's trying to lead to be able to bring everybody's focus right back to the drill at hand. And people can say it's on the athlete, it's on the athlete, it's on the athlete, which in an ideal world, every athlete can do that, but not every athlete can. And that's the, that is the, I guess, hallmark or trademark of a good coach being able to recognize when an athlete can't and putting them right back on track. Like Ross was very good at doing that with me Yeah, where like, Cody C was I me. Mean, I could get Cody C to fuck around a little bit, but like, like Cody was a little bit more like locked in versus me. I was more carefree. But then as soon as I knew like Ross had a thing when he said, when he had a certain tone in his voice, I knew that was time for me to fucking, Hey, shut the fuck up. And we're going to do this thing. Yeah. And that that's, I think the hallmark of a great coach being able to distinguish when we need to have fun. And when we need to get that athlete to really lock the fuck in, and this is what we're doing for intensity. Where or how do you notice, like, what do you notice when, you know, athletes are too far down the fuck around rabbit hole and you're like just constantly having to beg them to focus? Like, what are some hallmarks of that? And then I guess secondarily, how do you start to address that? Honestly, point blank, you say, do you want to be here? Like you, you have to nip it in the butt in some way, shape or form, right? Like yeah. it's, if it's too far where they're fucking around all the time, you have to lay the ground rule down because that's the only way they're going to bring back to center. It's almost like you got to smack them, but please yeah. don't because that's abuse. Hmm. So like you got to smack them with your words. So that's where you just it's straight up fucking cold Turkey. Hey, do you guys want to be here or am I wasting my time? Yeah. Because I'm, I'm here giving you my time. If you want to waste it, that's fine. And that might not be the right thing to say for everybody, but that was always what smacked me in the face with, oh, I respect this person. I value his time. Am I the dickhead in this situation? And it forced me to bring it all the way back into center and like, oh, okay, this is time to focus. This is time to really lock in. But if you don't do that big step, like I needed the big step always. You can't just like, you can't just nudge me. I need the fucking cattle prod, Mm -hmm. but to the like small focuses is like you just give them a little bit more attention you just focus on them a little bit more you walk your way over there and you're like hey i need you to fix this this and this and give them different cues to focus on so that they're focusing on seven things at once or having fun gets funneled into the goals that we're looking at if you don't want to be a dick you can just give them tasks yeah. as soon as they have tasks to focus on then they're going to lock in a little bit more because they know what they're tr- what you're trying to get out of them yeah yeah, the problem that I notice with some of that too is is the frequency with which I have to do it. 
right? If you're going over somewhere, you're giving them a test, you're trying to funnel their focus, and then it's not 10 minutes later, you have to go do that again, and then right. you go do it That's again. Fair. It's like, yeah. Then, then you get it gets to that end point where you're like, all right, what, what the fuck are we doing here? Like right. What, well, that's when you got to smack them with your words. Are we going to be, like, yeah. Are we what the make fuck this, are we doing here? Why are you here? If you're not here the, to get better, why are you wasting time? Yeah. Are we making this a meaningful training session or is this somewhere, just somewhere you have to be, right? Which unfortunately it gets that way with some athletes with, you know, off seasons, out of camps, inactivity type of stuff. It's like, all right, what are, what's our ultimate goal here? That's why I think setting you know, a cliche of like setting goals or like having objectives to do overarching behind your training, not just like this is our objective for the day of get better at this position or suite from whatever, but like overarching, like, okay, we know you're not going to have a fight for the next six months, or we don't have any, pl any plans to get a fight in six months. We really need to fucking up your jujitsu, or we need to really up, you need to gain 10 pounds, right? It's not, or whatever the fuck it is, mm -hmm. right? I think those background training goals, super important. And then getting your at your athletes to value them, right? Like that that's a huge piece. Because I see this the most happen, this lack of focus with people that don't have fights coming up, right? Like it's easy to be focused when you're and in I, camp. And I see it most in the weight room. I, yeah. don't, I don't see it on the mat as much as I see it in the weight room because it's not their sport. Yeah, they're, they're like, directly, I'm, I'm a fighter. Yeah. I'm not a lifter. Why would I give you 100% effort when I'm out of camp? Yeah, but then that's when, yeah, you refocus and like, this is the most important time to give me the effort. And 100%. this is, yeah, this is something that, you know, will pay dividends in the background. So, um, yeah, but that, I think giving those background goals and tools is one way to get them to focus, but then also identifying why, right? I feel like a lot of coaches jump straight to that. Like how is like, all right, fucking yell at them or this or that. It's like, yeah, I agree, but that's that's like short trying to sort, short circuit the problem, and then you just run into that problem again, right? So it's it, it's really just like seeking the why. It's like getting athletes to value the background goals that started them in this training journey in the first place. Yeah, a hundred percent. But I so we've been talking about like how to bring people in. Mm -hmm. What if it's better for some people to not be in? What what if it's better for people to be able to be creative? Like, is there, uh, do you think there's a time and a place for it to like, yeah. obviously drills work. Otherwise yeah. we wouldn't do it. But yeah. I always found personally, the most growth I had as an athlete was my self-exploratory time. Or yeah. honestly, it sounds fucking bad. But like when we were doing like live goes, I'm just play wrestling. Yeah. Like finding situations that work for me. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's a super individualistic approach. And I think coaches should be adaptable to see that, right? Like there are a couple of individuals on our fight team that get the worst, best work done while they're talking shit. hundred percent. Right? Like that was, they, that was me. They grow because they're talking shit and, and they're pro problem solving chronically with the person in front of them rather than go one-on-one -on -one or, or do 10 reps of this takedown or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think as a coach, you see that, recognize it, but then also like communicate it, right? That's because then you'll get. And I know it's annoying as a coach. I but... hate it, dude. I hate because <laughs> <watching this shit. laughs> like, like, as a coach on the work. other end <laughs> now, I know how fucking annoying yeah, it is. It is like but... honestly, like this is how this is how Tommy is. Tommy's probably the closest yeah. relationship I have with an athlete, and or at least one of them. And like this is how Tommy is. Me and him will literally bullshit back and forth, and he'll look at me. He'll be like, "I'm not fucking doing that," and I'm like, "The fuck you are." Like yeah. you most definitely are doing that. He's like, doc, come on, fuck that shit. <laughs> and I'm like, shut the fuck up and do it, bitch. Yeah. But, and it's frustrating, but that give and take uh, in his rest period is what allows him to clock in, clock out, clock in, clock out. Because when he's on, he's fucking on. Like when I yeah. ask him to do stuff, when he's, when he grabs a bar, or when he's doing a sled sprint, that motherfucker's got murder eyes. Yeah. But in between we're fucking around. But yeah, and, and the problem exclusively exists when that turning it on doesn't happen, right? right. Like, like that's yeah. that's where you have to like. Well, that's where you have to reevaluate your priorities. You have to guide <laughs> your athletes to the contextually appropriate behavior, mm -hmm. right? Like that's that's essentially what coaching is in a nutshell. Like guiding your your athletes to contextually appropriate behavior. So the biggest flaw I see in that is like communicating expectations, right? Like. Tommy knows that you need him to get to fucking business when it's not rest time, but he knows he can fuck around during the rest time because it's fucking rest time. 100%. I'm sure he knows when you're doing, you know, your late camp metabolic work, fucking around during rest time is, is not really an option, 
Right. We need like to work we did aerobic breath. power. We did aerobic power yesterday. Like yeah, we he had fucking ninety seconds off after a, f- I think it was a six minute series. Like yeah. He's breathing. Then. He's not fucking around. Right. <laughs> so it's like, again, just ensuring that it's contextually, contextually appropriate. And then we're getting some work done. Right. Like, because again, that's, uh, that's something I had to learn as a MMA coach right away is like, I needed to immediately up my standard of um, what's good enough work. Right. Because, you know, professional athletes, really disciplined martial artists, really good at their discipline, martial artists. I shouldn't say disciplined. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Funny. Um, but what I see from the outside is like, all right, they're doing reps. Oh, that was impressive. That's a good sweep. That's whatever. Right. They're doing the thing really well, but that's not the meaningful work that we're after. Right. You can definitely do some cool shit that I like, but that's not what we're fucking doing right now. What we're doing right now is focusing in on this position and trying to feel the new skill because this is what athletes will do 100% of the time, especially when you're coaching through a, a new or a different situation. They'll say, fuck that and go back to what they're good at. The famous words, it's not going to work for me. I'm not going to do this. Oh my God, dude. It's like, I don't care if it's going to work for you. You have to get better at it because it's a tool <laughs> in your game, right? For like sure. um, we had a practice two weeks ago where the only thing we did was dump finishes off your single from the wall, Right. I was like, ah, this doesn't work. Then I'm, you know, it's not a high finish percentile, blah, 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 blah. I was like, you need, just need to get better at it. Like shut your mouth, get better at this thing because we're not doing it to finish it every time. We're doing it to give me a better feint for my chain wrestling. We're doing it to have an option in a back pocket. We're doing it for what if it works, right? And so uh, contextualizing that and then um, allowing your athletes to like connect to that is, I don't know. Another way to foster focus, but also, like I said, up your, your expectations of the scenario. Well, I've found for like situations like that, where the athlete doesn't necessarily connect with what's going on. They don't, they, they oh, that not move's not going to work for me. It's not about the move. Like if you, you, you keep saying like, oh, you got to like make your, make your intentions known, right? Yeah. Make, make them understand what you're trying to get across. <clears throat> if I contextualize it as. I'm not teaching this to you for you to only forever just do dump finishes. Yeah. This is a concept. I need you to understand the concept of sitting on the toilet when you're trying to do a dump finish. I need you to understand the concept of what is tension in a single leg. It Mm. might not be a dump finish, but you can get so many different concepts out of this one move that can be applied Mm -hmm. to the other things that do work for you. And guess what? The better you get at those concepts, the better you're probably going to get at the dump and then it might work for you. But if you just say, Hey, we're doing dump finishes and they're like, Oh, fuck it. That's not going to work for me. And you don't explain, we're not doing this just to learn a new move. We're learning. We're doing this to make you a better wrestler because we're learning something from it. Even if you don't use this move, that's what connects with athletes. That's the, yeah, that's a hundred percent. The, like, I think a lot of times it's the background system at work, right? Like, cause When you get really good at a martial art, like, again, the best I can speak to this is in wrestling because that's where I'm the most advanced. When I'm wrestling, I'm not doing moves anymore, right? That's not, that's not the level that we're at, right? I'm feeling what's happening and I'm adding this piece when I feel this piece and then I'm going to pair it with that piece and then this piece. And then you're, you're like rapidly putting a puzzle together to get a takedown, right? And I, I have those, all those puzzle pieces, like kind of floating in the air as I'm juggling them. And then I see this happen. I'm going to snatch this puzzle piece, put it down. And it's in the perfect exact right spot if I get a takedown, right? That's where we want to be. But in a lot of contexts, especially with mixed martial artists that maybe not have the wrestling background, I need to give them some puzzle pieces. They don't have enough puzzle pieces floating in the air, nor do they have the skill to isolate one puzzle piece at a time, right? Like you, you mentioned tension on a single leg. That's one puzzle piece, right? A lot of times you have to learn that with the other four puzzle pieces attached to it in a dump single finish, right? You have to recognize that six piece puzzle piece and get really good at it in order to break it apart into one puzzle piece at a time, right? And so like um, with that metaphor, that's every martial art, right? By the way, that's striking, that's jujitsu, that's Muay Thai. Like if you can isolate those pieces and then you're like freestyling with it, with those puzzle pieces, that's when you get really dangerous. That's high level being a chef, not a cook, but there's no shortcut to that. 
you have to put the work and the reps in to get, to see those puzzle pieces, right? Yeah, I've n- I'm not a big striker. I'm not going to go out there and run some complex series without knowing how to jab first. If I don't know how to tension my body through a jab or tension my body through a cross, yeah. I'm not going to go out there and try to put together six, seven, eight com- like eight piece combinations. That's just yeah. it's not going to work. It's going to look sloppy as fuck, and it's not going to be effective. I need to learn the concepts of all those different things and then I can build upon it. But that takes yeah. fucking time. Everybody. It takes so much time. And then I hate it too. Cause you watch like the chefs on in the UFC start to do it. Right. Like the, the a huge example is athletes will be in the octagon and they're throwing like just singles. They're throwing yeah. a jab once they're throwing mm-hmm. a cross, they're throwing them in isolation. Right. And at times it's an apt criticism to say, all oh, they need to throw more combinations. Right. Sometimes that's correct. But Watch Conor McGregor fight. He threw singles all the fucking time. Mm-hmm. That's he his range finder. Fuck. Watch Alex Pahea does it all the time. Exactly. And like, <laughs> so sing, throwing the single is not the problem if you don't know what you're doing when you're just throwing a single at the problem, right? So it's like, that's a chef idea. And then combinations absolutely work well when you find the right time and space for them, right? Like um, this weekend I was watching uh, UFC 304 and I think it was – the English Hardy, is that who it was? Fighting the Lachlan guy? Oh, Hadley. Hadley, yeah. yeah. He was throwing singles and touching all day. And then he find a found a super appropriate place for a four-punch combination, and all four landed on the head. It mm-hmm. looked like Conor McGregor's combination against um, uh, Marias. And it was fucking nasty. I was like, that's how you use like singles to a combination, right? Could Marais. I do that? What? Conor fought Marlon Marias? Uh, Eddie Alvarez, sorry. I was gonna. I'm like, yeah. I don't think that happened. He was a 35er. No, Eddie Alvarez. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> they uh, do just, both look just like Brillin from yeah, just DBC. Dudes. Yeah. Um, but I was like, that's how you do that. Could I go do that? No, I don't have the puzzle pieces. I I can't rapidly snatch those puzzle pieces together in that sequence because I'm not as skilled in striking, right? But that's what I identified as like. That's what it looks like when you hit a perfect chain wrestling attack and end up on the back, right? And so I think that like that segue of skill development is uh, too much in the background all the time. Right. Well, how, so how do you start to train that? I guess that pattern recognition is basically all that is, right? Like how do you no. as a coach start to get your athlete to start training that pattern recognition? Well, I mean, it, it goes back to the analogy a little bit. Like first, I need to give them chunks of puzzle, right? I'll give them six to eight pieces in a row, right? Uh, you know, inside position to a snap down to a blast double, right? Like you learn this routine, right? And, and I guess this a lot of how I was coached and then a lot of just skill acquisition in general. Like I'm going to teach them a chunk, right? And then we got to get, we got to put the work in. Like, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just biased, but I think wrestling is a sport you have to do a million and a half reps in, get the feel for it. And you just have to like put your head down and do it. Eventually, you'll find that nice double entry in a different context. You're like, whoa, that felt like the blast double that I hit from my snap down. And it's like, what's cool is you'll find how it fits for you, right? Yeah. It's, you're not, everybody can do a blast double, Yeah. but how you set it up is going to be unique. I can't hit a double like Jordan Burroughs. I'm not yeah. athletic enough. So, <laughs> like, unfortunately for me. So yeah. like, I need to find how it fits my context. Again, but you need the, you need the puzzle piece of a double, right? Mm-hmm. You cannot... Well, you, I don't think I've ever actually hit a double, but okay. But you've used it a million and a half times <laughs> to set up a single, I guarantee you. 100%, right? yeah. Yeah, so it's like you got to f- teach the chunks, right? Then I think your athlete can parse out the individual puzzle piece from a chunk. Okay, it doesn't mean that they can utilize, they can snatch it from the air and put it where it needs to be, but it means that they can see the individual puzzle piece. Okay, now I'm going to teach, you know, a chain attack or a recovery shot or something that uses this puzzle piece in a different context right? I have the puzzle piece. Oh, it also fits into that chunk. Oh, it fits into that chunk too. All right. Here's how this, ch- these chunks fit together, right? So now I have some individual puzzle pieces, some chunks that I can use interchangeably, right? And so, and all of this happens via a million and a half reps in a million and a half different contexts, right? Like you might start with your technical approach, hit a million of these routines. Okay. Then it's okay. Hit a million of this different routine. Okay. Now I need your partner to give you a good look and you have to problem solve. Which routine do I hit? Right. And so you slowly up the stimulus, up the response, give more puzzle pieces, identify more individual puzzle pieces. And then when you wrestle live, it's like, I need you to focus on in on 
you know, trying to hit what we've been practicing or figuring out a different way. And again, this is super hard to like think of in the moment, right? You have to rely on a lot of your automatic pilot to do that. But if I have, if I've given you the puzzle pieces, you've isolated them in a different context, you can throw them down via feeling better. Right. No. And so, um, yeah, <laughs> chunks, interchangeable chunks, isolate the individual puzzle pieces and then apply that in a live situation. Damn, Alex, it sounds like you're actually planning your practices. Ahead of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yes. Is that, <laughs> is that an important piece of coaching? Uh, from what I've heard, that is one of the most important pieces and everybody should be doing it. Yeah. No, and it's that, well, that's something that's one of my biggest pet peeves is you, sh- you should always have a plan, right? Like even for as me as an athlete, like being a little bit more carefree, you don't get to be like that as a coach. If right. you're a carefree athlete, guess what? No coaches should be carefree. You can't just freestyle when you get there. You have to have a plan in place. Oh, you, have you to, can. Uh, I've seen it. <laughs> okay. But you cannot be as successful as a coach. If you freestyle the entire time. Well, and I, I agree with that hundred percent. I think the way that people find their way there is such a slippery slope, right? To freestyling? Yes. Well, I see it. Yeah. The strength and conditioning is a good example of this, right? <laughs> yeah. Just put a wad up. Right. I have, you know, I have, you know, 30 different clients I see a week. You know, this guy only comes in once a week. Is it worth writing out a full program for him? Maybe not, <laughs> but that's like your first step down the slip and slide, right? right. Oh, this guy right. only comes in once a week. I, I'll just think of the session as we go and it'll be fine. Okay. Yeah, I'm like, oh, that person, he he's built similar to this guy. He'll just do that. that yeah. And he's out. not very consistent. It's only two yeah. times a week. Yeah. So I'll, yeah, I'll just, I'll just make the program up as we go. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're six weeks later. What the fuck did we do in the last session? Yeah. I guess I'll think of something new. You know, it's like, if you don't have a written plan. I don't know. I don't care if it happens handwritten. I don't care if it happens in Excel spreadsheet. I don't care if you use Google Docs, whatever the fuck you got. If you don't have a backbone physical plan, you don't have a plan. If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Exactly. So um, are some people really good at being charismatic and creating shit on the fly? Yes. Some people are really fucking good at that. Overarchingly, Will that culminate to the best plan you could have had? Not a chance. No. So no. That, that's because, the thing. Well, like, and the reason being is because you don't know where it's going, right? Yeah. You can, I am a very good freestyler. That's how I've always been my whole life. Yeah. If, if I only freestyle for my professional athletes, I don't know where they're going to end up. The reason you make a plan is because you start with the end and work your way back. What do I want this athlete to get out of this four, six, eight, 12 week training block? Then I work my way back after that. If I'm freestyling every day, I'm working from the front back and the results are not going to be as solid as if I start with, okay, this is my goals. How do I get that athlete to these goals? Well, and I think that's where we talk about greatness. Greatness happens when you can do both, when you have to do both, right? Like same thing for an athlete. You have to have an overarching game plan, how you're going to win the fight, start working on that. But you also have to make in practice, in session, in round adjustments, you have to be a great freestyler in the exact moment, right? Because not all your athletes are going to come in 100% ready to go, right? Not all your athletes are going to come in without injuries. Not all your athletes are going to come in in the right mental focus, right? Whatever happens, you have to be good at that adaptation and freestyles piece within the grand overarching plan, right? right? Like I'm going to steal your shit. You have to have, you have to write your plan in pencil, right? Yeah. But guess what? You still wrote a plan. Yeah. Right. Everybody. Oh, you have to write your plan in pencil. You have to write your plan in pencil. You have to be able to freestyle. Guess what? Part of that comes from writing the fucking plan. You still got to mm-hmm. write it first and then you can use the eraser. But if there's nothing yeah. on the page, you don't know what's there. Yeah. So it comes down to like discipline and how you operate. Right. I see a lot of this more in a mixed martial arts setting. Right. Like very few, you know, jujitsu professors have a like have notes that they reference mid class. And I get that, right? But I don't, like, but that's fine. Right. Like let's I <laughs> I literally have my phone like propped up against the pillar and it's got the Google plan of practice. Right. It's like that old thing where like the athletes kind of run up to the pillar, see like what the fuck do we have today? Type of deal. And it's like, whatever. But a lot of guys that are in it, maybe they're teaching this class three times a day because they run in a school and an academy of jujitsu and like they don't need necessarily the notes, they know the plan. 
but you have to have a plan. You have to have it written out in the background somewhere. 100%. Right. And, and like the further frequency and like idealistically you get away from that plan, right? Maybe I wrote my master plan three years ago, but I haven't gone back and looked at it. You might as well be operating without a plan. Yep. Right. Like again, we all, cause the work gets to be so much, right? Like you're running six practices a day. You have however many clients you this, that, but you're got shit piled on your plate, right? We get away from the plan and the, the quality of the work that we're doing. Right. So that's where you got to implement some of these routines and disciplines and uh, like behaviors that just genuinely allow you to be successful and good at your job. Right. Not many people get lazy without a reason. Right. Right. Like, it, normally you start to move away. Like Alex said, it's just a slippery slope. Like you don't get lazy because, oh, I just woke up and ah, fuck it. I don't care anymore. It's slowly it starts working and you start piling on more work, piling on more work. You don't have time to write a plan. You don't have time to do these different things. But that's what, like you said earlier, that's what the greats do. The, the greats make a way, they find a way. They, they make sure they have a plan and they have a system that's planned out, ironically enough, well enough that even when they get flush with work, they're able to still enact a plan. They're still able to create a plan. And that's what separates okay from good and good from great. You need to be able to develop a system that you have personally and your team has and whatever business you're in has to where even if you're having an off day or even if you get over your head in work, you still have time to develop and follow the plan forward. Mm -hmm. If you don't have those escape valves or safety valves, that's not a good enough system unfortunately. And you need to go back to the drawing board, make a new system or revamp your system and keep working until it is running basically foolproof. And there's never going to be anything that's foolproof, but you need to have a system that can enact the plan yeah. when there's too much work to do. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. hundred percent. And I think, uh, it's a robustness to your system, mm -hmm. right? Like it, it works even though I don't have time. Right. It um, might not be the, it might not be the best situation. Right. But the, the cool part of a good system is even if there's too much shit flying at the wall, the system's yeah. still going to win. Right. It yeah. still has enough different pathways to where you can get back to a positive environment. Yeah. And that's where like, I don't know, I think like people always reminisce about like the good old days or whatever. It's like, yeah. it was simply because your plan was fucking forefront. It was mm -hmm. the only thing you're like, so in it, you didn't have to think about it, right? That's like, yep. that's what I equate to my like high school wrestling experience. Like I was able to focus in so fucking hard on this one goal and ambition of becoming state champ because I didn't have to worry about things like paying mortgage or cooking my dinner or whatever, right? Like those, there's less interference and you're so in the fucking plan that it's there. Like, and so for people to manage that through a professional career and, to, and into adulthood is uh, like enviable. Right. Like they've done a good job with that. And so they have that robustness in their plan. Um, but I don't know. I think that's a, yeah, a lot on being prepared and ready to go in practice. hundred percent. Yeah. No shit. That was a, <laughs> that started as a freestyle, but we talked a whole lot about that. So maybe we'll change the title. Well, anyways, everybody, interesting news. This is Alex's last podcast. Yeah. Big time. He's leaving us. He's going to become a firefighter. He's going to go save lives and shit. <laughs> uh, but uh, so I can no longer say, and as always, badass strength coach, because he won't be there anymore. So, um, but I, I just want to say thank you to Alex. I'm pumped to see where he's going. I'm pumped for him um, to be able to go conquer this new venture. Um, and legitimately, I joked about it, but legitimately go save some lives and, and really yeah. make a difference with what he's doing. So Dude, it's been fun. It's been a pleasure. But all you at home, you gotta, you're stuck with me now. So yeah, buckle good up. luck. Good luck. But no, I, I'm so grateful for everything that Builder Fighter is and has been and will always be uh, for me and for the, the people that we serve. So I'm super happy um, to have been part of this and to have been podcasting for 200 episodes with my this best friend. This is our friend. 200th episode, by the right? way. And yeah. so, I don't know, it's a, like I said, a bittersweet transition. That's how it's been the whole kind of last month since I've known. But um, super grateful for all the experience that we've had with building a fighter we've had on this podcast, we've had with people listening. So, um, very, uh, humbled by this opportunity for sure. Yes, sir. Well, 
like I said, buckle up, motherfuckers, because it's about to be a wild ride. Oh, yeah. So uh, if you guys got to get in touch, all the information is going to be in the show notes. It's going to be emails and Instagram. Um, if you guys are looking for any programs, that's going to be available at buildingafighter.com. We got customs. We got presets. We got membership options. All those chilling there, buildingafighter.com. I believe it's slash programs dash one is the actual mm. webhook. Mm. Uh, but all of that's there. If you have any questions about that, like I said, hit us up at the information in the show notes. And as always, Dr. Austin Shane. Alex Friedman. And we are out. 